Hey everyone, welcome to Inside Track. This is my weekly live stream. Uh, it's about one hour long. I pick a topic and I go through it. Today's topic is how to use triads to create more complex harmonies. I had a little bit of a tough time um, with the titling of that one, but on on the on the thumbnail or whatever it's called. But anyway, that's what we're going to go through today. I've got some stuff prepared. And if you look in the description box below, there's a link to a zip file that has a PDF with notation. And for those of you that can't read music, an SMF that you can open up in your sequencer or any other kind of music program. It could be Logic or it could be GarageBand or Reaper or Pro Tools or Cubase. Give me one second. I just want to turn the volume down here on my headphones. There we go. That's better. Okay. So before we get um, into it, just let me take care of a little business here. If you like this video, give a thumbs up for more content. Please subscribe and to be notified. Leave any comments or questions below. Those of you that are here now, leave comments in the chat room. I'll certainly answer them. And um, also, uh, I don't have a Patreon or membership or any of that. And if you like this video enough, there's links in the description box to my iTunes and Amazon stores where you can p purchase a single or an album. I've got lots of music up there for my original albums for sale. So one of the things, um, anyway, well, thank you so much for watching and let's get into it now. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, hey, Mark, good to see you. I'm doing well. Thank you, is um, when I studied harmony in college, I studied four-part harmony and I studied something called species counterpoint, which is a step-by-step -step method to learn how to write contrapuntally. And then I studied jazz piano and I did a lot of transcribing and I learned, looked at some books and I figured out different kinds of ways of voicing chords. And then there's been some other things that I've worked on. And the point of this is that there's no one way to learn harmonic language. But what I will say is, is that aside from it being a lifetime study is that the more harmonic vocabulary that you are able to access, the more emotion that you'll be able to express with your music because that's where all the emotion comes from. Harmony and also if you're doing ensemble pieces, how you orchestrate that harmony. So one of the one of the things I try to do for myself and when I try to uh, pass on this information to other people is to think of the simplest ways with which you can create more complex sounding music. When I was a graduate student, I studied with the Scottish composer Thea Musgrave, who herself was a student of Nadia Boulanger. And we looked at a piece by Roger Sessions or Milton Babbitt or one of these, you know, really intellectually intense composers. And it was, the sheet music was incredibly detailed, how it was notated and things were figured out like almost mathematically. And then she played a, showed us a sheet music of a piece of hers where there were indications and outlines written for the people to play, the musicians, to get the effect that she wanted. She would have like maybe a group of notes and she'd write something that says, play these randomly in random order with random rhythm starting out slower and over the course of the next eight bars, pick up your rhythmic activity. And when you listen to the two pieces side by side, there was not that much difference in terms of complexity, the way it sounded. But what she did was create very complex music that was relatively easy for the musicians to play, as opposed to trying to figure out, you know, how to play seven against six while the other musician is playing 13 against 12 all at the same time, things like that that are just really a nightmare. And so you can apply that principle to harmony. And you could listen to somebody say to you, I'd like to play um, a C13 with a flat five and a sharp nine. 
and you know stuff like that and and yes you should know that stuff but I don't really actually think about that when I'm playing chord voicings I'm thinking about sound and shapes right and the basic building block shape of harmony hey inverted popes nice to see you are three note structures right two note structures can be a little bit ambivalent in terms of what harmony they are if you play a C and an E it could be part of a C major triad which would be C E and G or it could be part of an A minor triad which would be A C and E it could be part of an F major seventh chord which would be F A C and E you see you see what I'm getting at but once you've got three notes you've got all the ingredients you need for a harmony so let's go over let's do the split screen here and we'll go to the now there are three kinds of three note structures all right and I've got them right here I've got what I call triads the second one here on the top line we can call those tri chords and I'll get into those in a second and then we've got the suspended fourth which is uh, something completely different a triad from my perspective is three notes that all have some kind of an interval of a third if we look at a major and and what I'm going to talk about right now is foundational stuff that you probably all know but it will help what's coming up next and I want to make this a complete lesson so if somebody's watching this and doesn't understand this stuff they can figure this out and again there's content linked to in the description box that you can have all this material as a PDF and for those of you that can't read music as an SMF that you can open up a standard MIDI file that you can open up in any sequencer Ableton logic etc etc so our first example here which is right this let me zoom in on this which is this guy here this is a major triad so going from the top to the bottom we've got a minor third from E to G stacked on top of a major third which is C to E so we've got right or a major third and then a minor third C to E major third minor third and I'm assuming that you all know intervals the next one which is minor is a minor third and then a major third C to E flat E flat to G the diminished chord which is the third one are two minor third intervals on top of each other C to E flat and E flat to G flat and then the augmented triad which is two major thirds stacked on top of each other now um, this is a topic for another time but the last two diminished and augmented are symmetrical chords meaning that they use intervals that break up the octave into symmetrical subdivisions this is way way advanced but if we take minor thirds and let's see let's do this yeah minor thirds C to E flat E flat go up another minor third to G flat go up another minor third to A or B double flat and then go up another minor third you get back to C so that minor third divides the octave into four or five equal parts and the same with an augmented triad major third major third and major third so that's that's 20th century music theory but just it's just an aside so the next thing I want to talk about three note structures are these here in the right hand part right we've got this C I mean D E flat and G D F and G and there are more of these that I'm playing here G flat B natural C G flat B flat and C right so those are three note structures what I call those are incomplete or fragments of seventh chords which means those four note structures and the top note is an interval of a seventh away from the bottom note so in other words if we look at the left hand part right here we've got 
E flat, G, B flat, and D. So that's an E flat major seventh chord. If we take away the B flat, we've got E flat, G, and D. And this is an inversion of that, right? That can also, and what's interesting about these fragments is that they can be, and this will be something that I get to in a minute that we'll be using in minor in, in the tri, reg, regular triads is that these are incomplete chords which means that they are not completely defined so in other words these three notes can belong to an E flat major seventh chord they can belong to an E flat major seventh chord with a sharp five right it's got the B natural that's in there it can also be part of a C minor chord C minor ninth or C minor ninth with a major seventh or right it could be a part of a lot of chords so that gives you a lot of flexibility and the same with the rest of these you can see that this chord here could be part of a G minor chord or a G seventh chord now this is interesting here because I, I don't usually teach these kinds of chords but the left hand structure is C E G flat and B right so that is a major seventh with a flat fifth. And this is found there. Or you can have a, a diminished chord, right? Or a, a, a major seventh, well, a, a diminished triad with a major seventh, right? This could also be part of that. And the next one, you could have a half diminished seventh chord or a seventh with a flat five. So these, these structures here, I tend to use them as left-hand chords with voicings like this. And I'll get into that in a future one. And then the last one, but, but today we're just going to stick with the triads, but I am just doing sort of preparatory work. So what we've got here on the bottom is suspended fourths. Now, in, in music today, Suspended fourths are used as their own structure, and a suspended fourth, uh, in first inversion of that, well, let me go back to this guy here, is a two chord that you hear in music by, let's say, Steely Dan, and then the next inversion is a fourth chord, and you hear that in jazz. But in typical... Um, traditional harmony, the suspended fourth is a contrapuntal function, meaning that it's prepared linearly and it happens on a weak beat and it holds that weak beat note, this is, it suspends it over for another beat into the next measure. And that's what I've got here in this area here. So one, two, three. And if you play the F, in that second chord, so I'm going from F to C major. It would be called a struck suspension. And actually, uh, I believe it's fourth species counterpoint is all about suspensions, right? And so that's not a subject that I teach, although I did study it in undergraduate school for uh, way too long. <laughs> okay, so that's our basic three note structure wrap. Let's move a little bit further ahead. Now, <clears throat> one thing that I want to tell you all is that to master harmony, if you want to be a composer, you need to have some facility on the keyboard. You don't need to be a great pianist, but you do know, have to know how to play chords and harmonize melodies on the piano. Um, I wouldn't say I was very good at math, Starlight Sign, but I definitely did better in like my math SATs by a couple of hundred points over my verbal or written skills. So, uh, yeah, I definitely have more of that kind of a mind. Yeah. But I'm going to try, and from this point going forward, I'm going to make it a lot easier than everything I just said. So that, that's, I just wanted to get the foundation there. And I will do some of that stuff later on in the future. So what you want to do is you want to be able to play these chords in all all keys, those four chords that I mentioned. So what you want to do is I've just got a couple of rote practice things here and with a metronome you would just
Very simple. And then you go to B flat. So I'm just going through the circle of fifths and you learn all your triads and all your keys. It's funny because when I was 19, I took less, some piano lessons with the great jazz pianist, Jackie Byard, who was teaching at New England Conservatory and he lived in Hollis, Queens. And I used to drive in from the Suffolk County in New York State uh, into Hollis, Queens to take lessons from him. And this is the first thing he had me do was learn all my triads and all the keys. And I did it, and I was like, why is he doing this? But then the, the, then the reason became more apparent as he started showing me some more harmonic stuff. So, um, okay. And then the same thing with minor chords. You just learn them, right? All the inversions. And then your diminished chords, the same thing, which is the third line here. And again, this is all in the SMF and the PDF. And then the last one, oh, I don't have the augmented chord. I missed that on that. All right, so you do the same thing with the augmented chord. So you learn those chords. Now, that's one way to learn them. The next thing you want to do is realize that all of these chords are found in major and minor scales. All these triads. Right? So if we look at this first guy here at measure 29, which is up here, you can just, we're in the key of C, right? I'm just playing triads going up the scale, and this you all probably know already. But if we look here, we've got uh, the major, which is, starts the C, minor, minor, major, major, minor, and then diminished, and major. So in a major key, we're missing the augmented chord, but we've got the other three. And then once you start learning your triads by rote at first, then you could start creating some exercises that are a little bit more fun, like I've got here at measure 33. So just playing them in, in key. So. Right, so I'm just going C, F, B diminished, E minor, A minor, D minor, G, C, F, B diminished, E minor, A minor, D, G, C. And you can make these up in, in many ways. You could do stuff even like this. Let me change scene so you can watch my hands. Right, I'm just jumping up a third in the key. Right, you can do that in D flat. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you could do that in the key. Now, so you can make up your own things and keep a diary, write them out, and just just use them to assimilate this stuff inside of your hands. And you don't have to be, like I said, a great pianist. When I was doing my graduate student work, Jimmy Heath, great sax player, he wasn't a great pianist, but he knew all his chords on the piano and could harmonize any song. So now if we look at this particular minor scale at measure 37, which is this, and we got minor, minor, now we've got our augmented, major, major, two diminished, and then minor. And then the same exercise at measure 41. So you're starting to learn your triads, you're starting to get around with them. And why this is important to get this foundation is if we look here, and I play this simultaneity right here, this eight, eight note chord. All right, these are all the notes in the key of C major, all played a third apart. Right? And if we look at that, we can break that up into a bunch of triads, which I've got here. So this is the first three notes, the next three notes, the next three notes, right? That's a G triad, B diminished triad, D minor triad, F major triad. And if I had an E on the top here instead of a C, A minor. So basically we have 
we, we can, by just going up in minor, th in thirds in the scale, we can play every triad. So, what, what's, what's good about that? Well, that means that we can take those triads and we can play three notes in the right hand and a fourth note in the left hand. And then we can create a little bit more complex chords. So, if I look at 49, starting here, we just play the right hand. I've got an E minor chord. G, so it's in first inversion, which is why learning your inversions is, is really important. Yeah, yeah, Starlight, I, I think at first you speak the chords so that you know what you're playing. And then eventually, once you get it really good, you don't have to. I don't think about the chord names now when I play, and actually, when I if I do think about them, it messes me up. But when I started out, I, I always did that, so it's really good to know what you're doing. So we've got, at measure 49, we've got E minor in the right hand, F major, B flat major, right? So these, these are two in, in first inversion, then B flat and root, then E flat in first inversion, then G, then B, uh, C, C flat or B, B major, right here. In second inversion, then D flat in first inversion, then F, and then again E minor. All right. So let me play that progression just the right hand. And if we notice what I'm doing is I'm keeping the melody, the, the top note. Almost stepwise into the last chord. So now what you can do is start to add notes in your left hand. time. So that's some really complex harmonic stuff with four note textures using triads in the right hand and a different bass note in the left hand. On this particular one here, I'm just using minor and major chords in my right hand. Okay? So basically, right, C major 7th. The next one is B flat, A, C, and F. So that's like a major ninth chord, but I'm missing the D. And then the same here. So what I could do is E minor over C, F over B flat, B flat over E flat. E flat over A flat, then uh, a C flat major over A flat, or B B over A flat. That'd be easier for everybody to understand. Then D flat over E flat, then F over G, and then E minor over C. So that's the start. Right? You learn your triads, you play around, you figure out games, you take like a month or six weeks, and you spend 15 or 20 minutes, three or four or maybe five times a week, just with a metronome going methodically through everything. If you're not a keyboard player, and you're just a composer and you want to learn a little bit, I think that learning it all in your right hand, one at once with your right hand and then with your left hand is fine. You don't have to play them together. Just knowing and get your fingers around them and being able to figure them out and getting familiar with them will be really helpful. Then the next step would be to start experimenting around with just major and minor chords in your right hand and adding bass notes to them to see what kinds of textures you can come up with.
So let's, let's switch this here. Yeah, that's right, Starlight. I agree with that. I used to do that too. I've spent hours and hours practicing this stuff. All right, so let's take, uh, I'll take a C note. I'll take a C note, please. <laughs> and let's see. All right, so let me see what chords sound good on top of that. Well, obviously, that E minor chord sounds good. Well, what if I played a B flat? That sounds good. Right, what about a G? Great. Now, the next thing to do is once you find some of these things is to play around with the spacing. So right here, right, I've got the C, G, and I've got space between the C and the G. There's a D that could go in there. So do you see that, how that sounds so different? That right there. That is a beautiful sound, right? And then later on, once you start adding five notes, uh, you can really come up with, you can really, really go to town. But four notes is really good to start with. So what else sounds good? Well, obviously E flat, that would give you a C minor. Seventh, what about F sharp? Yes. Little Stravinsky. Right? So that sounds good. What about D? Yes. That's just a D7 in third inversion, right? Take that C, drop it down. So you don't want to have C in, in the chord, right? You want to have three different notes than the note in the bass so that you have four different pitches playing at the same time. All right, so let's go back to this view here. So if we look at measure 53, I've got these diminished chords, right? To G minor. Diminished on the downbeat. Right, so that this is just a little diminished. Diminished, diminished. Now let's add our bass note. So I'm doing this over a D. Right? That's that's. So you've got all these passing chords over what I would call a pedal point in the left hand. But again, triads in the right hand. And then the bottom one, all augmented chords in the right hand. And let's add our left hand. Incredibly complex sounding stuff, right? But it's just a triad with a fourth note added. Really cool. And it's just a matter of experimenting around. And notice I've got voice leading. Everything's moving by step. The top line, right? The top line, G sharp, A, G, F sharp, F, E flat. So it's all smooth voice leading. All right, so let's look at a couple of more of these I've done. So this is all with just four notes, right? So let's look at 61. So what have we got here? We've got a G, C with a G, B flat with F. We've heard those two before. E flat with A flat. And then this is a nice one. E over an F. 
right? And then E with an F sharp on top of it. Then E flat with a D minor chord on top of it. Then an E over C and then A over B. So these are just major and minor chords. And again, nice smooth mel melodic line and the left hand. Using that as a foundation for moving forward with a cool improvisation. Let's look at measure 65 and we'll use some of the same sounds here. I added some diminished chords and an augmented chord into that one. So we've got, right, F over B flat. B flat over E flat. Those are the same kinds of voicings, just different inversion in the right hand. E flat over A flat. And then this would be um, an F diminished chord, right? In second, in first inversion. And then a D flat over G flat. And then an, um, this could be either an F or an a augmented chord over the B and then an A minor chord over B flat. So you could see how with this with this concept, right? and some experimentation and some playing around, you can come up with some really beautiful, rich harmonies that when you look at it, it's simple triads in the right hand and an alternate bass note. Now, let me just get a little taste here. One sec. Yeah, they, they do, but they're, they're not that difficult, right? It's a it's starlight. It's just a very simple concept that just you have to sit there and experiment around it, but you do have to put the time in to learn your triads. All right, so the next bit that we've got down here at measure 69 are two note structures, and I call them dyads in our left hand. And I just have a few written here. You know, there are a lot more than this, but let's, we have a major third, a minor third, a fourth, a fifth, a minor seventh, and a major seventh, right? So what happens if we create five note textures using two hand, two note left hand dyads? So on our first one here at measure 73, we're going to concern ourselves with a mi minor or major third. And, a, and some sort of seventh interval in the left hand. And this is Bud Powell's innovation. One of Bud Powell's innovations in bebop is that he started, instead of playing big full chords in his left hand, played these shells that he could improvise over. And we can apply our triads to those shells. So let me play at measure 73. more time. Right, so it's just C minor, F7, D minor, G7, C minor, F7, B flat. So in the key of B flat, that would be 2, 5, 3, 6, 2, 5, 1, right, if you're a numbers person. 
with your Roman numerals and your figured bass. But basically C minor, F7, D minor, G7, C minor, F7, B flat. And the right hand is a B flat triad, a D major triad, C, E major, then G minor, F sharp minor, and F major. So the, I'm going up by half step and then down by half step in the top part of the right hand. And then you put that together. So if I take that, the top, the thumb note out, uh, or the, the second note of the dyad, just play the root note. And that still sounds good, right? Just a little bit more juicy with that second, with the fifth note in there. So if I were to play that. Right, you can see how I could do a little Latin rhythm like that. It's kind of fun. Let's take a look at 77. Similar thing with those similar structures, right? Just doing D, a D, G7, a C, F7, B flat. So just a little the similar as before. Just to working our way around a little bit and using augmented triad in the right hand. Again, chromatically on the top voice, nice voice leading, and C augmented, like a B augmented or a G augmented. No, that's a, uh, yeah. And then B flat augmented, F augmented, and then A minor. All right, so, so I'm just doing chromatic augmented triads. And then that's not that difficult to conceive of. If I were to tell you the names of those chords, though, right? D7 or D9 with a sharp 11th. G7, sharp 5. C7 with C9 with a sharp 11. F7, sharp 5. B flat major 7th with a raised 11th. B flat major 9 with a raised 11th, right? It gets to be really pedantic to be remembering all those names. It's just easier to know your... And you can come up with really great structures. All right, so moving along with this, we have something a little bit different here. So on this one, I'm using just thirds until we get to the end here with the fifth. And then we've got triads on top of that. So let me play the whole thing at 81. Hmm. Maybe I'll put, make sure make that a C sharp on the last chord instead of a straight D chord of D major seventh. All right, so we've got B minor, A, C in second inversion, G, D in first inversion, D in root position, B minor in root position, and then this is a D here on the last chord, but I think I'd, I'd prefer to have a C sharp, which would make it an F sharp minor chord. And then just going down, thirds. So I'm basically going down in steps, half steps, whole step, and then thirds. And then my fifth, like going from G to E, where I mean moving in thirds. And then from the bottoms going from uh, an E down to a C, and I'm moving that into a fifth. So just, but it's very complex sound. One more time. So that would be C major with a raised 11th or sharp or flat 5, B minor 11th, that would be a B flat 6, 9 with a sharp, with a flat 5 or raised 11th, right? See how, uh, how pedantic and difficult it gets to remember all these? A minor 11th, G major 9th, E minor 11th, 
C major uh, with a sharp nine with a sharp 11th and then to a G, right? It just, it gets confusing to think about all those and think about the intervals. It's just much easier. To think about triads and thirds. Now, here in the next one at 85, I've got fourths in the left hand. So I've got G to D, C to F, and B to E. Right? So let's do this. And then just D, E minor, and D. Right? Three blind mice. Okay, let's listen to what that sounds like all together. Pretty nice, right? Now, let's look at measure 89. I've got tritones in my left hand, or C to F sharp, B to F to B, E to B flat, E flat to A, and then a fourth here at the very end. And then I've got an E triad, A, D, G, and then a D flat augmented chord. Let's put them both together. Right? You see how they can lead to some unbelievably complex sounding music where the chords are so rich and juicy and it's just it's just really for me it's it's such an easier way to think about harmony and then let's look here at 93 so another example so these are all available on the pdf for you to play through and on the smf to play inside of your sequencer so you can look on a piano roll um yeah so here we've got D flat, D major, D augmented, F major, F sharp, and then, hmm, should that be an A sharp? I wonder, hmm. that might be a typo there. Okay, E minor, B diminished, E minor, and then just moving thirds in the left hand. So let's play that all together. Complex stuff, right? Thirds in the left hand, triads in the right hand. And, you know, the thing is, that when you're working on this stuff, you can't get here right away. You can get here in a couple of years if you put in the time. And like I said earlier, 15, 20 minutes, three, four times a day. First, learn your triads in all keys, all inversions. Then make up some, learn them in scales. Then start making up little exercises in the scales like I did. Right? Just and then minor. Make up your own stuff, keep a diary, keep a log, then start experimenting around with maybe two or three note, two or three chord progressions where you're adding a bass note in your left hand, right? So instead of doing these longer things like I've done, maybe what you'll do is something like this. Uh, actually, let's go here. Right? That, that that's that's big. Right? That's just a G chord over a C, F chord over B flat, and then E minor over A. Three chords. You know, and write a dot keep a diary. You know, uh, maybe just sequence it into your computer if you can't write music down on uh, you don't have a notation program. There are free notation programs. Print out some manuscript paper if you need to, but just keep a log, keep a diary. That's what I've did for years. That's why I've got this material to share with you. 
All right, let's take a look at our next bit here. All right, so here I'm going between thirds and fourths. And I'm going in the right hand, E minor, B diminished, A minor, G, G, C, B augmented, and then D. And then the left hand, together. Oh, play it better, sorry. Now, at the bottom, Miles Davis did this, right? in the song So What from his uh, Kind of Blue album. Right? So what are these? This is an interval of a fourth in the left hand and a triad. Right? And this is all, all the white keys and then the D in, is the root key. So it's in D Dorian. And they just went up and down the scale and they did the same thing up a half step, right? So that's the so what chord. Okay, what else do I have here? Okay, so this is really, this next bit is much, much, much more advanced. And I can improvise completely with triads and one and two note textures in my left hand. This next bit, I have to figure stuff out. It's, it's very complex, but you'll see the beauty of it. And it maybe, you know, it'll excite you to learn these things so that you can at some point figure these kinds of things out in your own music. So once you've got a five note chord, or a simultaneity. Those five notes can be arranged in a way Great, Matt. That sounds great. So again, like I said, thank you for watching. There's the uh, PDF and the SMF in the description box linked that you can, I've got it up on Dropbox that you can all have. And uh, yeah. So five note structures can be reordered into fragments of scales. So let's take a look at that. So here's our first example of the five note structure, right? We went over this before. Okay, so right here, that's our first chord. If we take these notes and we arrange them stepwise, we get B flat, C, D, E flat and F. Uh, wrong one. I want to be over here. Sorry, my friends. Right? That can be a pool of notes that can be rearranged into even more fresh harmonic structures. So if we look at beat four of this measure, here is one of them. So this is the same chord as this, just rearranged. Our second one, right here, arrange that stepwise. Well, we have to jump up to that A. And then this is a chord that we can get from that. Right, and then this one here is B flat over F. That can be rearranged into that beautiful chord, etc., etc., etc. So if we look at measure 117, let me play this.
One more time. That's the same as this up here, right? And all this is is a bunch of experimentation and playing around and but understanding some of these concepts and then using your own hard work and creativity to expand them out into their fullest, all the different potentialities that they contain. So, right, 77 through 79. So this progression here. Right. If we follow the same here, the same concept as the other one. Uh, like these incredible harmonies. Uh, yeah, Mark, I would if the music called for it. Yes, and I this is I write like this. I'm teaching you what I do. You know, uh, that's my f philosophy about teaching. I teach what I know, and what I do, and I f this is one of the one of the methods I use to create chords. Right, it's not the only one. There's many, 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 many ways of creating different co interesting chord voicings. This is one of them, and this is what I wanted to prepare and cover in this lesson today. Um, yeah, so I, I do, I do use this in, in, in work. Yes, for sure. Without a doubt. Like if I were just to start, like, let's say I, um, for example, So I just improvised something playing triads in my right hand and one note in my left hand. That That's it. You know, Copeland did this kind of stuff too where like at the beginning of, of um, Appalachian Spring, he used triads there, that very complex sounding chord. That is an A triad in first inversion and an E triad in second inversion matter if a piano has stretched or equal temperament tuning uh, you know mbdg i'm not quite sure about that i don't know how to answer to that because i use stretched tuning all the time um i don't really use equal temperament that much so what i would say to you is that you would just you know there's the thing is that i don't know if there's like in in 2021 it's not like we're in 1750 where there's rules about how you create chord progressions and how you voice chords, right? All that stuff's been worked through and this is like whatever sounds good works. That's the, that's the kind of thing that we're into now. And my whole goal here is to show people simpler ways to create things that sound harmonically complex and that har harmonic complexity will benefit your music by adding more expressivity and more emotion to it. That's sort of my goal here with this. So I think that uh, that's quite a bit of stuff that we've gone over this week. So next week, I'm not sure if there's going to be another episode, um, taking a little vacation. I'm going to try to record, pre-record something and then premiere it next week on Friday. Uh, but I'll, I'll post something on my stream to let you know what I'm doing. Uh, I Yeah, I've been busy with... Um, I'm demoing this this microphone here, this TZ Audio microphone that they've sent me that I've been using for my voiceovers. 
and I've been writing a track and miking a bunch of instruments just using this, so I've been busy with that. But anyway, uh, that I'll try to get that up in the next week. But anyway, um, if you've got any questions after the fact, leave them in the comment section. I'll go back over them and answer them. Don't forget to get your download so that you have this material for you to look at. Yeah, thanks, my friends that watch every week. I really appreciate you guys. Keep me doing this stuff. All right, so anyway, I've been Pete Calandra. Please like, subscribe, share, hit that bell, do all that stuff, leave comments. Thank you again so much for watching. I hope this has been helpful. I've really enjoyed doing this and answering your questions today. And thank you so much, and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.